You may remember <laughs> yesterday uh, in our time together, we uh, talked about the economic theory of price, and we showed that um, the uh, determination of price is uh, based upon preferences that people have, <clears throat> and then uh, demonstrate in uh, making bids to buy things and making offers to sell things, and how in markets we get uh, the clearing of the market and the efficient or economizing allocation of consumer goods and producer goods. You also um, uh, uh, learned about the, uh, the same approach of uh, pricing with respect to money in the lecture given by Dr. Sandy Klein, <clears throat> where she explained how the purchasing power of money is determined in the same way by this process of preferences and um, uh, voluntary exchange and, and so on. Now, all of these prices that we talked about yesterday then, the prices of consumer goods, producer goods, and money, were what Murray Rothbard would call uh, cash transaction prices, by which he means that the two parties engaged in the trade uh, fulfill their uh, obligation in the trade uh, at the same moment in time. So there isn't any intertemporal dimension to these prices. <clears throat> so what we want to do in uh, our time together uh, today is talk about the intertemporal price of money. What happens in pricing when one party in the exchange fulfills his or her obligation uh, in the exchange sooner and uh, the other party fulfills his or her obligation later. And so here we get the intertemporal aspect of action. Now, in order to uh, assess this or to think about uh, the intertemporal uh, nature of uh, pricing, we need to set it in the broader context of time in human action more generally. And so that's where we'll begin. We'll start with some fundamental uh, principles of uh, time or the temporal aspect of uh, human action. And then we'll move to uh, a brief uh, description of the two different ways in which persons uh, value their action with respect to time. And the first of these, uh, Joe Salerno likes to call time placement. And this refers to the timing of action or what we uh, talked about uh, again yesterday, uh, the chronological aspect of action. So yesterday we talked about the logic of action. But now we can talk about chronology. When are actions taken? Is this, again, just haphazard, or is there an economizing uh, structure to decisions that people make about uh, the, the timing of actions? So we'll deal with that briefly. But that consideration has nothing to do with the interest rate, which is our main topic, right? Uh, this has to do with the second way in which people value uh, their actions with respect to time, which I've already mentioned, is the intertemporal aspect. What it happens uh, when they start an action sooner and end it later than what, you know, how is uh, uh, economizing done uh, with respect to the intertemporal dimension. And then, and then we'll get to the theory of interest once we have all of that as background. So uh, to begin, uh, let me again refer to what we talked about on uh, Monday. There we focused on the finitude of the human condition that we're finite beings in a finite world. And as such, we distinguish between ends and means. And then given that basic distinction, we worked out the, the various uh, relationships between means, consumer goods, and producer goods, and the the process of valuing and imputing value and then pricing and so on and uh, so forth uh, with respect to that uh, aspect of human life. And what we want to do uh, today in thinking of the uh, uh, intertemporal aspect is to, of course, focus on the fact that we're temporal beings, that we exist in the stream of time, and therefore time is an ever-present consideration for us when we think about our actions. Uh, and as temporal beings, we, the basic distinction we make is between sooner and later. And so everything 
uh, uh, is built upon that particular distinction, just like everything we talked about on Monday was built upon the distinction we make as finite beings between ends and means. Now, some of the basic principles uh, with respect to sooner and later, w we've already uh, seen a little bit, and uh, I'll just mention those first, and then we'll get to the main part that we need to uh, focus on. <clears throat> we know that action always uh, exists in a sequence of steps. So it's always started at one moment in time. We begin an action. Let's say we want to produce an automobile and then have the automobile as a consumer good. We start by mining iron out of the ground and then producing steel and then, right, and then uh, forming parts for the car and then assembling the parts and uh, so on and so forth. And then we have the car and then we use it and so on, you know, through time. And so this is what we're pointing out, that every action always has the same intertemporal structure to it. We start the process of production. We decide, yes, we're going to act in this respect, and then we start the process of production, and then we produce the consumer good, and then we begin to use the consumer good to satisfy our ends. <clears throat> and uh, th this is um, this uh, implies then some of the things that were talked about uh, yesterday. For example, uh, Dr. Peter Klein talked about entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship, of course, is uh, centered around the fact that the future is uncertain when we make decisions about action. But the, but the reason the future is uncertain when we make the decision to act is because as temporal beings that are finite, uh, we don't know and can't perfectly predict the future stream of events. We, we can only anticipate um, how the realization of our end will work out at the moment that we're deciding to act in a particular way. And so you've already been introduced a little bit into this uh, question of the temporal nature of things. But what we want to focus on is a different aspect, and this is the duration of action. So every action has a duration. It has a, a beginning point and an ending point. And, of course, this duration is always set within the stream of time at a particular point. And so there's always the time before an action begins, and then the time during an action again, from the start of the process of production to the end of the usefulness of the consumer good in uh, generating its services. <clears throat> and then there's the time after action. So this is the you know, general categorical uh, structure of the duration of action. And the duration of action, I've been speaking about already these two parts, but we can break the duration of action always into these two parts, right? The period of production, the time from the start of action, to the uh, beginning of the attainment of the end is the period of production. And the period of production has uh, further subdivisions like uh, working time. So I mentioned this again with an automobile. If you want to produce an automobile, you have to extract rubber out of rubber trees and then to go through this process of producing the rubber and then forming it into tires. And then once you have the tires, you ship them to the auto plant and then you assemble the tires onto the other parts of the car and so on, right? You have this period of, you have working time as a period of production. And with an automobile, you also have um, uh, maturing time because the body parts will be painted. And once they're painted, the paint has to cure. And there, you're just sitting there, right, twiddling your thumbs while the paint cures. Now, it is true that uh, in human action, uh, the, the econ economizing investments will be made to adjust these processes of production, right? We can, we can lengthen them out or shorten them. You can... Uh, auto uh, 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 entrepreneurs can, uh, you know, use technology that uh, where the curing process is shorter, right? They can have capital goods that that um, cure the paint faster or something like this, right? So the point is that the, these processes, these time periods and processes within them, are subject to human choice. They're subject to economizing. And so, but there's always a period of production, right? And it always, at least in principle, has these subcomponents. And then there's a duration of serviceableness of the consumer good. And some consumer goods, of course, are perishable. You get a, you get a, um, uh, you know, a burrito, a hothead burrito, and you eat it, and that's it. You get a car, and it lasts for ten years or whatever, and right. And so, and once again, the, these durations of serviceableness will be structured by entrepreneurs in a way that is economizing, in the way that people prefer. Right? They'll 
they'll try out different configurations, more durable, less durable. Um, uh, automobiles or houses or whatever it is, and, <clears throat> and uh, with, an, with an attempt to uh, satisfy more fully uh, the preferences consumers have for this uh, aspect of, um, uh, of a good, whether it's more or less durable. And then the other thing to notice about uh, duration is that not only are these component parts of the duration of an action subject to human choice and therefore economizing, so is the time placement of the action itself. And, and that's what we want to uh, turn our attention to here. Uh, let's say we have this timeline, the timeline from the left to the right. And the action, any particular action can be placed in this timeline according to whether or not the value of the action would be greater at one moment in time as opposed to another. So let me just use this example. My wife and I will be celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary on November 17th, 1983. Yeah. So, so, so th those uh, those uh, very appropriate applause uh, go only to my wife. You know, she <laughs> had me to put up with me all these years. So, but 40 years, and so, um, you know, it's it, it's possible for us as human persons, my wife and I, to agree to you know celebrate our 40th anniversary uh, tomorrow. That like the left side of the timeline, right? We we could do it any day of the year. But it's going to be more valuable to us if we do it on November 17th. That, that, that's just you know, right, an illustration of exactly what we're speaking about. This, this is a general principle then of any action. Any action could have a different value depending upon we, uh, the time that a person chooses to take it. And as Mises liked to put this, uh, time is an irreversible flux. That is, the moments of time are not homogeneous with respect to action. Because as the moments in time progress on the timeline, they, they um, entail different circumstances in which action could be taken, and therefore the action could have different value or costs associated with it in these different moments in time, right? Just like my uh, uh, celebration with my wife of, um, of our wedding anniversary. So this, again, is a generalizable, uh, generalizable principle about, uh, about action. And so what we try to do, of course, then, is economize with respect to this fact, this, uh, you know, realistic fact about action, uh, we take this into account, All right? So when it's appropriate, we, we, would, we would have a time placement of our action at that moment in time. We would start the action and stop it at the moment in time or across the moments in time when we think the value of it would be enhanced or, again, the costs would be lowered. <clears throat> Now, if this is true for action itself, it's also true for the goods that could be used to, in the action, right? And so there's a time placement of goods as well that follows out from the time, place, time placement of the action itself. So the value of a good can vary, the same exact good, right, could vary uh, depending on when it's applied in action. <clears throat> And, of course, if that's true, then, again, the persons who possess these goods will uh, pay attention to that fact and take into account, you know, uh, having the good at the moment, you know, or providing it at the moment in the market when its uh, value is the highest. Think of a case like uh, oil. So we have, uh, you know, spot prices for oil, and we have forward prices for oil, <clears throat> and uh, they're... Uh, entrepreneurs who are producing and refining oil and so on are interested in anticipating uh, what the price of oil will be in a month or in two months or six months or, you know, at these future dates uh, because it will impact their, their profitability of their operations. <clears throat> and so, uh, obviously, it uh, follows out then that uh, as economizing, economizing human beings, these traders would be interested in uh, making exchanges that reflect that, right? And these exchanges are called forward transactions. And forward transactions are just when the two parties making the exchange agree to make the exchange at some date at the future, you know, the, the future date, at which they agree on the delivery of the good and the price. 
And you'll notice that this exchange is still a cash transaction. This is not an intertemporal exchange. One party isn't fulfilling obligations under contract sooner and another later. They're agree instead of doing the cash tra uh, contract today in what's called the spot market, they agree to do a cash transaction at some future date, six months from today, three months from today, something like that. And if the forward price is uh, you know, significantly higher for oil than the spot price today, then there can be a better allocation into different temporal moments of oil. Oil could be reallocated from the present, where the price is low, to the future date, where the price is higher. And as that happens, the prices will come together. And so this is just the arbitraging activity that we see across people and across places and now across time. Right? This, this consideration has nothing to do with the interest rate. <laughs> right? We're just sort of setting the stage for discussing this. So, sometimes people conflate these, but, but uh, they're, they're actually conceptually uh, quite separable elements. So let's turn to the consideration of the interest rate. Oh, I'm sorry, we got the, uh, as I mentioned, the forward price uh, <clears throat> material that, uh, that I already mentioned. So we get this efficient, we might call this temporal allocation, right? This efficient time placement allocation of uh, some particular good as opposed to um, just, you know, using it uh, willy-nilly with respect to when it will be used. <clears throat> so then we move on to the question of the interest rate. And here we're talking about not time placement as a way of valuing our action with respect to time, but what economists call time preference. And time preference is referring to this intertemporal dimension. And it works in the following way. Suppose we have an action now in the timeline that's already placed in its economizing time placement. It's already the start and the stop is where the person wants to do the action in time. So we've set that uh, consideration aside. So the action now is where the, the, uh, it's economized, uh, getting its greatest value with respect to that starting point and that stopping point. Time preference then refers to what happens within the duration. It, doesn't, it isn't talking about what happens in placing the duration in one point or another. And what, uh, uh, what the consideration is, so we have this uh, fixed uh, place, uh, uh, time placement, uh, and we see the two parts of the uh, action, the period of production and the duration of serviceableness. What, <clears throat> what time preference refers to then is the preference to begin the satisfaction, the duration of serviceableness part. It's a preference to begin that part closer to the start of the action. There is always a conceptual preference to shrink the period of production because the period of production with respect to time is, again, just waiting time. We're, just, we're, just, we're going through this process of production where no, no, no satisfaction is coming to us. We don't have the car yet. We don't have the, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, experience of uh, going, going out and having a nice meal on my uh, wedding anniversary. We don't, we don't have that yet. We're just in the preparatory part, right, the production part. <clears throat> and with respect to time, this is, just, this is just waiting. And as Mises likes to put it, we as temporal beings have a disutility of waiting. We don't, that's just, just waste, right, to wait. We prefer, in other words, to, if this is, again, a production of an automobile, let's say, <clears throat> we prefer to just shrink that period of production so that we just snap our fingers and have the car. Right? We don't have to go through the mining and the extraction and the production of intermediate goods and all that, all that rigmarole. It would be better if we could just, boom, have the car, right? Shrinking the period of production and bringing the duration of serviceableness uh, closer to the start of action. <clears throat> uh, now, again, you can see it, the way the diagram exposes this. You can see that whether or not it, there's a time placement element in when the action starts or stops, we've already settled that issue, right? So, so suppose, in other words, that the duration of serv serviceableness, this person has said, they want the duration of serv serviceableness to start at the point in where the middle bar is, the middle blue bar is. They want that moment to, for the good to be in their hands and 
for whatever reason that that's preferred. Well, then time preference means the start of the action, we prefer to be closer, move to the right towards that middle bar, right? But what, what would happen if the start of the action is preferred at the left-hand side where it says start? Well, then we would prefer the, the middle bar to be moved to the left toward the start of the action, right? You see, these are two separate aspects of action, time preference and time placement. They're not intertwined conceptually. Uh, okay, so there's this disutility of waiting. Now, uh, that's the background. Most of the time when you see in the literature a discussion of time preference, you'll see it defined this way, which is perfectly fine if you understand this background. It's a perfectly fine way to put it, right? So time preference is often defined this way. The satisfaction, uh, 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 some particular satisfaction is preferred sooner as opposed to the same satisfaction later. Right? That's the way time preference is usually defined. And that's perfectly okay to define it that way, again, as long as you're not conflating that with time placement, which could be done, right? If, you're, uh, you, know, if you just see this statement, it, it could be that you would conflate the two. But again, that, uh, it's quite clear in Mises' writing that these two things are entirely distinct. Now, another thing to mention about time preference is something we mentioned about preference uh, yesterday. This is a logical category of action. This is apodictic, uh, it's uh, essential. There isn't any possible action that finite beings can take in the face of the scarcity of means. It doesn't involve preference, preferring one thing to another, choosing and preferring one thing to another. With temporal beings, there isn't any possibility that we could ever engage in action that has this significant temporal dimension without making a distinction between sooner and later and therefore having time preference, right? The, the, it, we're, when, when we talk about preference, we're not talking about uh, as Dr. Hoppe put it on Sunday night, we're not talking about the empirical magnitude of how people experience the intensity of their preference or the intensity of their time preference. We're not speaking about that, right? That's an empirical question that'll vary from one person to another. And, you know, for one person at different moments in time, they'll have d different degrees of time preference or preference for one thing and, uh, as opposed to another and so on. That's not what we're talking about when we're speaking about the theory of uh, the framework, conceptual framework within which we're trying to understand action as a general category, <clears throat> right? So we don't want to uh, conflate time preference with the idea that, uh, you know, this is like uh, the impatience of waiting psychologically. The impatience of waiting is just referring to the intensity of a person's time preference. If a person's impatient, they may have higher time preference rates than a person who's not impatient. But a person who, who's patient still has time preference because it's a requisite category of all intertemporal action. So that, that's something to consider as we think about this. Now, there are a couple of implications that we can draw out of uh, this definition, this concept of time preference. And you'll see some of this in the, in the lectures following out uh, today, especially about capital and uh, uh, the business cycle and things like this. And the first of these is the intertemporal production choices. So we, we, I've alluded to this already, right, that uh, as human beings, we can have different um, links of production processes. We can extend production processes out and further out in time, or we can shrink them. Um, and it, uh, again, it's another fact of reality about the human condition that the very shortest periods of production that we can engage in as finite beings do not satisfy very many of our ends because the shortest uh, production processes we can imagine are just immediate extraction of a consumer good out of nature. You know, pick berries off a bush or you, right, you gather apples under an apple tree and eat them. And well, okay, so not too many of our... Uh, um, uh, desires or our ends can be satisfied in this way. But time preference means then that as we begin to lengthen out production processes, it must be the case that we're anticipating that they'll produce either more goods for us or goods that we cannot produce by mere extraction out of nature, <clears throat> like an automobile, right, or a computer that obviously we can't produce with, a, with extremely short production processes. And so the idea of time preference is it's our time preferences that regulate the extent to which we're willing to engage in 
longer production processes, remember, in that period of duration of the um, action, in order to get something more valuable, a, a consumer good that's more valuable to us, um, it, it, you know, after the period of production. So we are, we are willing to engage in longer production processes as long as the payoff in terms of the duration of serviceable, right, the, the consumption services that we get from the consumer good are worth it to us, but they have to overcome our time preferences. And so we don't immediately start to engage in the longest possible production processes, right? After the fall of Rome, people, you know, in, uh, uh, in the outlying areas of the old Roman Empire didn't immediately begin to try to produce computers, right, or, right, or you know, some, some production process that would take them a long period of time. No, 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 they just, they just engage in, you know, production processes that are feasible for them, and then we, we progress slowly over time as a, as a civilization. We, we progress to the point, you know, building on the capital structure that's built up by our previous generations uh, in, into these longer and longer production processes that give us uh, m more and more valuable consumer goods in the end. So that's one consideration. And hopefully you can see right away that this will uh, have, a, have a great impact on the question of the business cycle. So in the business cycle, the, the basic problem is <laughs> uh, credit expansion through monetary inflation of uh, the central banking system and fractional reserve banks extends the length of the capital structure in a way that's unsustainable because it's not consistent with time preferences and the underlying uh, rate of interest that will eventually be re uh, asserted by people as they trade in markets. <clears throat> uh, and, then, and then, of course, the other uh, thing that we want to focus on now is the uh, rate of interest. And here again, there, there's some nuances, and so we have to be careful to proceed in, uh, in a way that's uh, expository of, you know, exactly what the arguments are. And so we talk about the pure rate of interest. And the pure rate of interest is, as I've, I've got on the slide, it's the time preference premium of present money over future money. This is the pure rate of interest. <clears throat> and the pure rate of interest, as we'll show in just a minute, is based upon nothing but time preference. We're not saying that that's the only consideration people need to make in discussing the value of uh, money in their hand versus money, the prospect of money in some future period. Um, uh, it's not the only consideration, but it's the fundamental one. And so we start here, and then we'll build a few toward the end of our time together. We'll build a few other considerations in, into this. So the pure rate of interest follows out from time preference. Uh, present money allows the period of production to be shortened. So, you know, the classic example of this is um, you get married, you're newlyweds, uh, you're earning some income, but you're living in a rental apartment, and you want to uh, buy a house. Well, you could just uh, you could cut back your expenditures relative to your income, and you could save. Ten years later, you'd have the fund to buy a house. You could do that. Or you could borrow the money. And if you borrow the money, the period of production is shortened by ten years. Right? And that's why people do it. <laughs> uh, they borrow the money, and then they and then they pay principal plus interest back over this time because they, because they want to shift the the duration of serviceableness closer to them, closer to the start of this action. <clears throat> so uh, so so this is again a generalizable principle of of, of intertemporal activity in uh, in human life. And in this way, we get the efficient by doing this by lending and borrowing. We get the efficient intertemporal allocation of goods. These potential homeowner um, is, is willing to pay the interest in order to get the present money, and whoever the lender is is willing to accept the future money payoff, which is larger than the present money, in order to part with their um, uh, sooner consumption activity, right? They're giving up their funding. And so it's mutually advantageous trade generates this uh, more efficient allocation of the funding away from those who value it less relative to future money towards those who value it more uh, with respect to present gratification, right, present uh, goods that they could use to satisfy their ends. Okay, so that gets us to the uh, argument itself, the, uh, the economic theory itself. And I juxtapose the, uh, the bottom row where we're talking about the argument with respect to time preference 
against the top row, which we talked about on Monday. Remember on Monday I had this, this bigger schematic where uh, we had the illustration of price theory from consumer goods down through producer goods. Well, this is just the top three rows of that previous chart that I have now on one row at the top, right? It's just that the argument is that what fundamentally determines um, prices of consumer goods is just our preferences. We just, have, we just have different preferences for things. You know, we possess certain goods, and then um, uh, some people wish to acquire these goods and are willing to pay prices that the people who possess the goods are willing to accept in exchange, and then we get the market, and we get market-clearing prices, and so on and so forth. But the whole thing is, is, uh, resolves back into just our subjective valuations of the ends that we can attain through these do, uh, two different possibilities, right? I own a good, and I can uh, attain certain ends with it. But if I sell it, I can get money, and then I can use the money to attain other ends that I value more highly when I sell the good, right? Or vice versa, if I buy the good. If I buy the good, I'm surrendering ends that I could attain with the money, but I'm acquiring the ends that I can attain with the good, and I value those ends more than uh, the, the ones given up. And so, so that's the argument, right? It's exactly the same with time preference, exactly the same structure. It's just that now what's being traded is present money for future money, as we suggested already. We just have uh, those who are demanding uh, to acquire present money in exchange for paying future money, and those who are willing to supply uh, the present money to the demanders, their lenders who are willing to lend to the borrowers, and who are willing to accept the future money, uh, uh, which will be of greater amount, right, because of the interest payment, um, in exchange for giving up the present money. Why do they do this? Well, because they have a future end that they, that they think that accumulating the fund will allow them to uh, acquire that's more valuable to them than the present ends that they could, they could uh, engage in with the money that they have. So, so it's exactly the same argument, right? <clears throat> and then uh, the other thing to note about this, uh, just to stress this one more time, is that this exchange uh, is always in terms of money and never in terms of goods. Uh, th that is lending and borrowing is always in money. We have a monetary economy. It's always in money and not in goods. And the reason for this is because if we were to trade in goods, if we were to lend and borrow in goods, then the outcome of what happened in the future would be an intermixing of these two valuation processes of time placement and uh, time preference. They would not be just based upon time preference. This is because goods have consumptive value or value as producer goods. And the value, as we've already said, right, the value of a consumer good or producer good can vary depending on the circumstances that change from moment to moment over time. But the circumstances of consumption and production don't affect the usefulness of units of money to perform the function of the medium of exchange. The medium of exchange function is, uh, is ongoing for any unit of money, right, uh, both across people and across places and across time. This is what economic calcul... We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll elaborate on this in just a minute to, if you're not convinced just by, just by this uh, claim. <clears throat> well, I'll show why this is so in just a minute. But, but the basic point, again, is that if you think about using a particular, let's say, $10 bill to buy lunch, it doesn't matter which one you use, right? They're interchangeably useful. It, it, there wouldn't be any difference. And the same, so it, so it doesn't matter, you know, you give one $10 bill or another to the, to the seller, uh, it, the seller would be indifferent <clears throat> between them, right? Wouldn't care. They're, they're equally useful as a medium of exchange. It doesn't matter what the consumptive changes are, you know, going on in the minds of one person and another, production changes or anything like that. And this, this, of course, also works then. Well, you can see this right away across uh, space, right? If I buy something remotely from someone else across space, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which, uh, you know, if I have two bank accounts, it doesn't matter which one I transfer my, you know, debit account claim from, right? If it's $100, it's, it, it's $100. It's, it's performing the same exact medium of exchange function. There's no difference. It doesn't matter what the consumptive and, and productive considerations are between the two people in the different places it, that that's not it has no effect and so what we're saying is that 
because we have intertemporal exchange and we have an interest rate, the same thing is true intertemporally. Same thing is true if you take money today and you, and you trade it for money in the future, we can show that, the, that there's an equivalence between the two, right? Whereas we could not show this with goods, be precisely because goods value can be different depending on the consumptive or productive conditions for using the good in the future. But the medium of exchange is independent of those conditions. As long as it's a medium of exchange, it's going to be useful regardless of the consumptive and productive con uh, circumstances that people find themselves in. So this is the, this is the argument that, uh, that we make here. And once again, I, I stress this a little bit because there's some, there's some ambiguity in the way in which terms are used in this field of interest that messes people up with respect to exactly what we're referring to when we talk about time preference and the expression of interest and so on, conflating money and goods and, and all sorts of things that I won't go into uh, detail about. All right, so now let's just uh, go through the logistics of that, uh, the details and the logistics of that uh, trade. <clears throat> so here I've, I, I've posed two different people, just again so we can see how it, uh, interest would emerge from preferences that people have. In the left-hand uh, side, we've got person A, who notice would accept a, uh, well, person A prefers $1,000 today to $1,000 in one year, right? You can see the preference rank of 1,000 today is above 1,000 in a year. And we're assuming for the sake of our argument at this point, remember the pure time preference element. So we're, we're saying that the purchasing power of the $1,000 is going to be the same. So we're setting that consideration aside. We'll get to that later. And so there, there would be a $100 premium that person A places on having, maintaining $1,000 a day versus getting $1,100 a year from today. But that person would lend the $1,000 a day at, at an interest rate of 10% or above, right? If somebody came and offered $1,200 um, uh, to person A uh, in exchange for the person A giving up 1000 today, person A would be a lender. But if a person came to, uh, if person B or some other person C, I guess, would come to A and say, I'll give you $1,050 uh, a year from today for 1000 today, person A would not lend, right? That's what that preference rank says. <clears throat> person B, on the other hand, uh, has a higher premium on present money than person A. It would take $300 premium for person B to lend his $1,000 today. And uh, person B would be happy to pay uh, up to uh, $290. That would be the maximum buying price, as we say, for obtaining the $1,000 from person A. Um, uh, person B has a more urgent uh, end to satisfy with this present money. And so economizing, social economizing would mean that the present money ought to go to B <laughs> because B has a more valuable uh, end to which uh, he or she is going to put this present money relative to A with respect to the present money, right, with respect to what's being exchanged. And so that's exactly what would happen. Um, the maximum buying price for obtaining $1,000 for person B is 1290 The minimum selling price for person A to, to supply the $1,000 is uh, uh, $1,100, right? And so they can come together and negotiate, settle on some particular interest payment, let's say a premium of $200, and the interest rate would be 20%. So you can see how the pure rate of interest is just set by preferences. There isn't anything else. You know, all the other considerations, the circumstances of life, uh, uh, have their impact on the interest rate through human judgment. That, that's the argument. We're not saying that conditions of human life don't affect um, uh, interest rates or, or, or prices, uh, you know, consumer goods prices and producer goods prices. We're saying the effect is always through human judgment. And th this is the filter, if you will, through which uh, people express their demands and supplies and therefore prices emerge. Okay, then, then the only other thing we need, of course, is the market. So just like we did with consumer goods, there'll be a market. Uh, it won't be just two isolated people making this exchange, right? There'll be all sorts of... Uh, uh, potential borrowers, you remember the data point here is point A. I looked this up yesterday if we want a particular example. 
The two-year uh, Treasury note interest rate yesterday was 4.81%. That's what we're talking about. That's the R0. Why is it 4.81%? And economists say it's 4.81% because that interest rate cleared the market yesterday for trading in, uh, you know, supplying and, and, uh, and demanding uh, these, these funds, right, through, through trading this, this, uh, this claim. That's what we're talking about. So the, the blue line, the light blue lines, are just conjectures. This is just the logic of action, right? Just much, what must happen if uh, instead of being 4.81% uh, interest, someone were to offer a treasury, uh, a two-note treasury at, at an interest rate that was 5%. Well, the person wouldn't find a buyer, right? And, you know, and, and vice versa for interest loans, right, loan rates of interest that were below this. There'd be excess demand then. And excess demand and excess supply are avoided by participants in the market since their preferences aren't satisfied when that particular uh, result occurs. <clears throat> okay, so what we see from this, just in summary, is that just like with uh, preferences for goods, for consumer goods, time preferences jointly or, or singularly determine two effects. One is the pure rate of interest, just like preferences that people have for bags of apples determine the price of apples, and the quantity of bags of apples traded. So time preference determines jointly the rate of interest and the amount of lending and borrowing that occurs, or we could say the amount of saving and investing that, that occurs. Time preference, time preference determines them both. All right, again, this is sometimes a point of ambiguity that trips people up in this field. <clears throat> so that's important to stress. And now let me get to this uh, claim that um, once we have a time market where there's trade of present money for future money and an interest rate that emerges, the, the, uh, the uh, time market interest rate makes present money and future money equivalent for economic calculation. So this is what you all learned about, uh, you know, if you've taken business classes about, or uh, classes in finance, about uh, how interest uh, can be compounding or discounting of present money in the first case or future money in the second case, right? So if I take $1,000 and I lend it out on interest at 10% uh, for one year, then at the end of the year, I'll get a payment of $1,100. I'll get the principal back plus the interest payment of $100. And if I enter into a contract whereby I'm going to receive $1,100 a year from today, then the present value of that $1,100 just by simple arithmetic right, or simple uh, algebra is $1,000. It's $1,100 divided by this interest rate term of uh, 1 plus the interest rate. So in other words, through the time market, these two amounts of money, a, pre a present money of $1,000 and money in one year of $1,100 are equivalent. I can have either one. And therefore, I can do economic calculation using the interest rate, right? Because the interest rate is making the it possible for me to have either the present sum of money or that calculated future sum of money. And so they're equivalent. And so the economic calculation is, in fact, uh, preserved uh, intertemporally uh, through, uh, uh, through the time market, that is, through, through uh, lending and borrowing. Now, in order to get to the nuance, we, we need to introduce the complications that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is, uh, as uh, Murray Rothbard likes to put it, this is the distinction within the time market of credit markets and in the capital structure. And with credit markets, we have a credit transaction uh, that I alluded to before, where one party is the lender, fulfills uh, his or her term of the contract sooner, and the other party is the borrower who fulfills his or her uh, term of the contract later. And these credit transactions then uh, could be either for consumer loans, and then the consumer loans could be subdivided uh, into the various consumer goods that are bought. So houses, we have the mortgage uh, lending markets, and for cars, we have auto loan uh, market. For general merchandise, we have credit card markets, right? And we have a different interest rate for each of these different kinds of consumer loans. 
we don't see a uniform interest rate, right? We see this, we see this variation. And uh, the, the other part of the, of the uh, time market is the whole entire structure of production. Because here, the entrepreneurs are fronting present money to the owners of the factors of production in anticipation of producing a good and selling the good and receiving revenue from the consumers at some later date. And in order for them to make this loan, in order for them to you know, suffer the opportunity cost of foregoing just lending the money that they have today out on interest and earning a rate of interest, if they, if they plow the money into the production process by buying factors of production, they need to account for the interest return that th that investment is uh, commanding, right, when they sell the output and receive the revenue from the, from the uh, consumers. And so that's the other part of the time market. And now, since I'm uh, almost uh, out of time, I'm going to run just to the end of this. Now I always do this. Why, why do I always? Why do I always do this? So, so in any case, <laughs> it's a the period of production is too long. So, <laughs> so in any case, uh, g given that we have the, this variation, right? Different kinds of loans that are made in different contexts, right? We can then see what the other factors are besides time preference that I've called here sources of the market rate of interest. So the time preference element, right? If people have higher time preference, interest rate structures will be higher. And if they have lower time preference, interest rates on that account would be lower. But there's also entrepreneurial uncertainty. And so if, there, if there's greater entrepreneurial uncertainty in particular kinds of lending, that's why we give, uh, get subprime mortgages, let's say, or you know, junk bond interest rates, right? Uh, then the interest rate will be higher to compensate the lender for the possibility of default and other uncertainties involved. And uh, if the uncertainty is, is less intense, then the interest rate structure would be lower for that kind of loan. And then there can be price premiums that emerge from, uh, you'll learn about this again uh, later today, uh, from what are called Cantillon effects that occur when the monetary relationship is changed. So when there's a monetary inflation um, the earlier receivers of money will see the prices of things that they're buying. They will bid up the prices of things that they're buying, right? And the sellers of these things will see a premium in their, in their net income that other producers will not who receive the newly created money later when the price structure and the economy has moved up. And so that, too, would enter in, right, to – that would uh, enter into the rate of return in certain lines of production uh, as an interest return. And then finally, there's uh, what, uh, again, you learned from Dr. Klein, Dr. Peter Klein, yesterday about uh, dealing with uh, uncertainty, the unanticipated changes in the PPM and the predictions that entrepreneurs are making with respect to whether the whole purchasing power structure of money will be higher or lower. So this is what we've seen, of course, in the last few years. As price inflation has picked up, right, the interest rate structure moves up. And I'll end on this note. The the, the weird inversion of the yield curve <laughs> that's been going on for a very long time is partly a reflection of the fact of these expectations that uh, investors have about the, about the uh, transitory or non-transitory nature of the heightened price inflation, right? This is why two-year interest rates are above 10-year because apparently uh, uh, investors in these fields don't think that the price inflation is going to stay that high for 10 years. And so they're not willing to you know, uh, engage in transactions at the higher interest rate where they think that, yes, price inflation is going to be pretty high for the next few years. All right. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.